What greater value is there but the Earth that sustains us? We face the greatest challenges of our time on a global scale. Although science has made possible the technological advancements on which we rely, a mere 200 years of industrialization has wiped out billions of years of creation and thousands of species. Rather than harnessing our planet's renewable resources, we chose to extract its fossil fuels, polluting our air, water resources, and land. The federal mandate that natural gas can be safely developed has led to the unprecedented development of this resource. The collateral damage to the environment and people in the path of its extraction, transmission, and storage can't be denied. And there is evidence that this choice is speeding us forward to climate disaster. You know, we're looking to start a citizen's movement of pipeline fighters to end eminent domain for private gain for these pipeline projects once and for all. If we build these pipelines, whether it's the Mountain Valley Pipeline, the Atlantic Coast Pipeline, or the dozens of other pipelines that are planned to come out of the Appalachian Basin, we will enable a doubling of natural gas production. That's, that's what the industry is, has in its sights. They want to uh, raise natural gas production over the next 10 years to twice what it is today. And it's a time of um, awareness for people around the globe that are saying no to fossil fuels and that it's time to move into the future of renewable energies. The Appalachian Basin, second only to the Amazon in biodiversity, is now the key source for the continued expansion of natural gas through hydraulic fracturing. There are 19 pending pipeline projects for the region that, if built, will lock us into unsustainable levels of production. Of these, the Mountain Valley Pipeline and the Atlantic Coast Pipeline, both 42-inch high-pressure interstate pipelines, are in a race to build through the Virginias. The Mountain Valley Pipeline is to begin in West Virginia's industrialized fracking zones, continue over 300 miles into Virginia, and would be built by a company with no experience constructing a pipeline of this magnitude. Promises of jobs and local hookups for natural gas are untrue. The company promises to put things back the way they were, but in Pennsylvania, where they face criminal charges, residents have already had their promises broken. Big Energy needs to protect its corporate financial interests. We need to protect something much more important. Our land, our water, the very air we breathe. It is here our story begins, and the global picture unfolds. Fracking is environmentally unsound. The gas is not for us. The jobs are not for us. We're living in a cul-de-sac, and if this mountain is on fire, we probably cannot get off it, and we all would die. Dang, you're killing people just so you can have better electricity. There are other alternatives in this world, and we need to focus on alternatives. We privatize the profits, and we socialize the damage. Private citizens no longer have any rights in this country. The country is now controlled by big business. Why would a federal agency even accept an application from an environmental criminal? The fossil fuel industry bought Congress. The National Gas Act basically empowers the federal government and the FERC to just build these things. The very agency that is supposed to be deciding is this a good idea has everything to gain by wiping us out. Both of these pipelines are unnecessary in Virginia in the wrong direction to go. We must aggressively combat climate change and transform our energy system. You know, we need politicians that actually have a backbone, that actually believe in our constitutional right to own land, to protect land, to steward the land, um, where we won't be terrified that at any moment a pipeline company can come knocking on our door and say, guess what? You thought you owned this land? You don't own this land. We're gonna put a pipeline wherever we damn please. I call it environmental predation. And I think our government ought to protect citizens from that. And they don't. 
Today is really an exciting day for the Commonwealth of Virginia. Governor McAuliffe was all smiles on September 2nd as he stood side by side with executives from Dominion Power endorsing the Atlantic Coast Pipeline. Fracking is occurring in Virginia right now in the far southwest Virginia counties. They are digging wells in the uh, coal field mine shafts that have been uh, abandoned now. So fracking is occurring. Well, just remember, the pipeline's going to go everywhere. We have 300 in Virginia today, as you know. It's not like if we do this one, it affects anything else. So just remember, we don't do fracking, so it doesn't affect climate change. It doesn't. Well, I think that a lot of Virginians are disagreeing. I'm just giving you the facts. They may disagree. I'm just telling you, we don't frack in Virginia. You know, it's easy to look at each of these pipeline projects as just a piece of infrastructure going in the ground. But the reality is it is a spider web of fossil fuel projects mostly made for the export market since America is already getting off of fossil fuels and making that transition to clean energy. But on a more fundamental individual level, where do their corporate rights to maximize their profits but up against my individual rights to say, no, I don't want this in my community, and who wins? And that's really the bigger question for our communities is, where, where is that line? And what we, we've known in West Virginia for 152 years is, there is no line. Individuals have no rights as it pertains to the industry, and I think that this is a, a horrible assumption. It's a horrible uh, pattern of behavior that we've gotten into as a state. And I think the idea that we should extract everything we can and send it out of the state is just uh, absurd. You know, one of the problems is that our federal government is essentially in cahoots with big oil and big gas. Right at the time we should be moving from an economy of extraction to an economy of restoration, we see these companies wanting to double down on a losing strategy. It would be like someone coming and asking you to bet your retirement portfolio on Eastman Kodak right as digital cameras started to come out. We must protect our water supply by banning fracking. Hydraulic fracturing is actually not anything new. The technological advances ha have come a very long way, but hydraulic fracturing has been occurring for more than 75 years. Today's fracking was illegal until the Energy Policy Act of 2005 exempted industry from the underground injection controls of the Safe Drinking Water Act. We trusted our best interests were held sacred in the name of progress. The blinders are now off as we watch all that we hold dear, sacrificed by special interests, seemingly blind, deaf, and dumb, to the catastrophic consequences of business as usual. As reserves of fossil fuels dwindle, the oil and gas industry has turned to fracking, a more dangerous and expensive extraction method that threatens our climate. Hydraulic fracturing, called fracking, is a way to access natural gas out of rock deep in the earth. Fossil fuel companies can frack anywhere, from wilderness to people's backyards. The process starts by drilling sometimes more than a mile deep to get to shale rock. Then fracking fluids are injected. This toxic cocktail requires millions of gallons of fresh water mixed with some over 600 chemicals, including known carcinogens, like lead, formaldehyde, and many more the fossil fuel industry won't disclose. Under high pressure, the rock fractures, sending the trapped methane gas back up the well. Most of the fracking fluid stays underground. The fluid that comes back up is either dumped into rivers, left in open pits that contaminate the air, or hauled away by big rigs. The toxic fracking fluid that stays underground becomes even more toxic over time as it picks up radioactivity and other contaminants. Those fluids and gases can seep into aquifers, which provide irrigation for farming and turns drinking water into a toxic mix. The industry conceals the exact amount of methane that escapes during fracking, but in North Dakota, where fracking is done primarily for oil, the methane is released and burned off in such great amounts that it's visible from space. Methane is a super pollutant. It is 86 times more disruptive to our climate than the carbon dioxide from coal-burning power plants. 
Air and water pollution from fracking leads to respiratory and nervous system problems and other diseases, including cancer. When you add up the climate disruption, air pollution, poisoned water, and the damage to our health from fracking, it's clear natural gas is just another dirty fossil fuel, and we should leave it in the ground. We are in a sacrificial resource zone. There is no other explanation for what we're dealing with. And they don't care. They don't care that it affects our quality of life, our peace and quiet, our ability to you know, operate a sustainable farm, our health. Why is Governor Tomlin's office promoting this project and possibly misleading the public in this way? Well, one of the driving forces behind this is that the West Virginia state government has leased public lands in northern West Virginia for hydraulic fracturing. Both our public lands and our waters are literally being given to big oil and big gas to do drilling, to lay pipelines, to do fracking. Uh, West Virginia has approximately 1,200 active hydrofracking wells. Between 2005 and 2013, they've used 17 billion gallons of water from West Virginia. The fracking companies have paid nothing for this water. I recently had opportunity to attend a public meeting where one of our uh, higher ranking uh, elected officials spoke and he made the comment that there are gas wells in West Virginia sitting idle because they lack the pipeline infrastructure to transport that natural gas to market. Which is absolutely hurting the whole reason why we have public lands and why we have public waters is to protect that for not only our generation but for future generations. So our government really has to get their head straight and realize their mission was to protect that land, not give it away to big corporations. I decided to start this program that I call the West Virginia Host Farms Program because we're surface owners and concerned landowners that are being impacted by what the industry is doing in these rural communities. I never dreamed that I would be running this program that's bringing environmental researchers and journalists and students to come to Ground Zero and watch drilling and fracking. In West Virginia, we have the split estate situation where one person owns the surface and another one would own the mineral tracks underneath. Mineral ownership trumps surface ownership. They have a right to what they call reasonable access to their minerals. The problem with that is that these leases that were given out were for conventional wells and they have a much smaller environmental footprint. So in this case, the surface owners here certainly did not want to have a Marcellus well pad drilled on their land. This takes out an enormous amount of a person's surface land. What do you call reasonable access? How do you define that? Because when these leases were negotiated, a lot of times they were negotiated when they were drilling with horse-drawn wagon. They get a conventional well, which just goes vertically down a couple thousand feet, leaves a small footprint, but because there's an existing well that's still in operation, that lease is still in effect. And then the industry can come back and drill Marcellus wells, which we know are much larger, take up a lot more land, and of course the legs that go out up to two miles could impact people who live down the road. So that's what's allowed to go on in West Virginia. So why should we be concerned about methane? The pipes are leaking methane. How much leaks is a critical technical question. So we go to the recent literature. We're gonna see that shale gas is not the cleanest, not the least worst, of all the fossil fuels, it's the dirtiest, it's the worst. So any transfer of using coal or oil to natural gas is going in the wrong direction. It's not helping climate change, it's making it worse. What you're seeing in this video in false color is the emission of large quantities of methane, natural gas, during the flowback period of a well that has just been hydraulically fractured. Everything that's yellow is methane, natural gas. As you can see, there's large quantities being emitted and those emissions occur over days. Hundreds of thousands of cubic feet of methane are being vented into the atmosphere to become a greenhouse gas, which over a short period of time is a hundred times more potent than carbon dioxide as a climate change agent. Fracking wells, pipelines, compressor stations, at every stage leaking methane with aging storage wells poised for failure. 
Porter Ranch, California captured the attention of the nation. The underground gas storage field of Aliso Canyon leaked more than 80,000 tons of methane onto their neighborhoods and into the Los Angeles basin. The largest methane leak in U.S. history, the disaster rivals the BP oil spill in the Gulf. Schools were shut down. Many suffered respiratory conditions and rashes from the gas fumes and oily residue drifting onto their homes. With 330 similar storage facilities in the United States, these leaks are going to happen, and there is no mechanism in place for quick response. We have a choice. If we choose business as usual, increasing the rate at which we're burning fossil fuels, the computer models say we're on that purple line. And it says we're gonna get into a danger zone where we've changed the temperature by two degrees centigrade by about the year 2045. You can already see that in the droughts in the West, the droughts in some of the African countries, and uh, Australia, other countries, and the, and the huge rainfalls that occur in some places, uh, floods, all this is going to continue, it's going to get worse. The tornadoes, all this is going to get worse if we keep doing this. Today in New, in New York, the, uh, at the United Nations, the US, China, India, and dozens of other, other countries signed the Paris Agreement on Climate Change. And the U.S. has a commitment as part of that international agreement to cut U.S. emissions of greenhouse gases by more than 80 percent by 2050. So when pipelines go in the ground or when fracking is happening, that's all connected to the bigger issue of climate change. The global climate change argument doesn't necessarily work for everybody. They want to know what the impacts are going to be in their local region. So for us, when we look at the impacts of natural gas um, transmission, we are feeding into the demand for that fracking up in Pennsylvania and West Virginia. There are over 8,000 wells through Pennsylvania, West Virginia, and up into southern New York. Fracking is natural gas that will be brought down through the proposed Mountain Valley Pipeline, Atlantic Coast Pipeline. Those pipelines are going to be feeding into the environmental degradation of the rest of Appalachia in which we live. This is all of our backyards. This is a large backyard of Appalachia that we need to be taken care of. So FERC has extraordinary power. It has the power to give a private corporation private land from uh, farmers or you know, even homeowners. And really, the, most of the opposition for this pipeline comes not from environmentalists, but from people whose land is going to be taken for this pipeline. And ultimately, we're seeking a certificate of public convenience and necessity to build a pipeline. That is, um, it's not a permit to, to build a pipeline, but really it represents a bundle of permits. The reality is EQT and NextEra are private for profit companies. They want to make huge profits from selling fracked gas, and they need a conduit. They need land for their pipeline. They want to take it from people living along the route of the pipeline via eminent domain. It's wrong, and it won't benefit any of us. The FTI report that was referred to that was commissioned by EQT shows all these economic benefits for Virginia. They're lies. They're not there. EQT and NextEra don't care about us. They don't care about our water. They don't care about our habitat. They don't care about our lives. They want to get their gas to market and make $8 million a day on that gas. We wouldn't be here tonight if EQT and NextEra weren't forced by FERC to host this open house. They're here to try to convince people, to intimidate people, to cajole people, to do whatever they can to get us to drink their Kool-Aid and welcome them to the Roanoke Valley, the New River Valley, and all of Southwest Virginia. We're not going to let it happen. He will determine what the impacts are, and then no matter how uh, devastating, we'll grant the certificate. Because that's what FERC does. That's what federal agencies do. They analyze environmental impacts and then say, go ahead and do it. What that means is that a commission decision cannot be changed by the executive or legislative branches, but a FERC decision can be challenged in court. The FERC is an independent agency and self-funding. It pays for its operations through fees on the industries it regulates. As FERC scopes out our land in order to provide an environmental impact statement, 
I hope they make sure that their definition of the environment includes us. Young lady, right over here to Charles. Um, I'd like to welcome you tonight to our public school committee to take environmental comments on the proposed Mountain Valley Project, or MVP I sometimes call it, in West Virginia, Virginia, in FERC document number PF 15-3. The Virginia Constitution clearly states that you should not grant eminent domain rights to private corporations that can make profits from the eminent domain right. The use of herbicides to keep the pathway clear will flow into the creek system, contaminating a vital source of water for irrigation, livestock water, and fishing. For long before the first natural gas flows through any pipeline, the major construction, excavation, and blasting of rock will disturb this delicate drainage and our water-dependent ecosystem. The environment does not need more of this gimme-gimme extraction mentality. Look where it's gotten us. Climate change is real, and we must stop the pipe lies. I did want to tell you that whoever designed this path is either a damn fool or a sadist. The FERC is not an unbiased agency. They're in bed with industry, and the commissioners go back and forth between industry and this federal agency. And we have written several detailed papers about that and are asking for an investigation, including Senate hearings. The underlying problem with all of these pipelines is that the National Gas Act basically empowers the federal government and the FERC to just build these things regardless of what the public thinks. I've seen pipelines being proposed to rush through Pennsylvania and Virginia and Vermont, everywhere I've traveled. And it doesn't make sense. It certainly isn't a sustainable approach. And the National Gas Act needs to be looked at. There needs to be public hearings to review our energy policy. It appears that the fossil fuel industry bought Congress to pass this, this law and force our, our policy. Now, some of those policies are you know, based upon the idea of domestic energy and not relying on the Middle East and being able to even export energy. But that's still not sustainable. It's not the way we should be going. And it certainly isn't in the public interest in the long run. Eminent domain is a huge issue on these pipeline fights for landowners. It's about protecting their individual property rights. But as Americans, it's about protecting our constitution. And it is outrageous that politicians are not standing by farmers, ranchers, landowners to protect their properties from eminent domain for private gain. And so in the presidential cycle, you have folks like Trump literally saying he loves eminent domain and that he uses it for casinos and parking lots. And then you have others essentially just dodging the question, saying, yes, it's bad, but it's perfectly fine for pipelines. Hundreds of maple trees are cut, destroying the Holleran family business started in 1950. The Constitution Pipeline is exercising their right of eminent domain granted by the FERC. Tree cutters are escorted by a dozen state police and heavily armed U.S. Marshals carrying assault weapons. Catherine Holleran said, they refused to see us as people and brought guns to our home. In New York, the State Department of Environmental Conservation refused to grant the company's request for water quality certification under the Clean Water Act. So although the Constitution pipeline now stands blocked, the Holleran's trees are gone. The concept that a private company for private property can take your land is outrageous. We should not stand for this. We want people to know, if not that the pipeline will come through their yard, that if some economic predator comes along and wants to damage their property, the state, the federal government will not protect them. That's something people ought to know if they think they live in a democracy. There are now more prolific supplies of natural gas, namely in the Marcellus and the Utica. The production currently exceeds the average demand, and those suppliers have a desire to get that product to market, and that's what we as a pipeline seek to do. These companies are just competing with one another to make a buck, 
and it doesn't really matter about us at all. It just matters which company gets access to the fracked Marcellus and Utica shale fastest so they can get it into the Transco line and get it up probably significant portions to Maryland where it can be exported as liquefied natural gas because now Europe is getting its natural gas from Russia. And all of a sudden we'll have a vast market. So that's why these guys are pushing so hard. That's why they want it in within two years. They want to get all that gas and be ready to ship to Europe, which will raise our gas prices. And yet they say this is in the public interest. And because of that, they can seize our land. Additionally, the demand for that natural gas will increase worldwide, including in Europe, India, and China. And then once the gas is in the pipeline, it goes for the highest price, not necessarily to the local consumer. It might be sent abroad through liquefied natural gas. Because it's costing them on the median about $4.85 per thousand cubic feet. So they can't afford to sell at 2.5 or 2.7. We're not building this for the export gas. <laughs> However, I hope you think you're Josh. <laughs> Honestly, I don't, number one. But number two, frankly, that's, a, that's just a larger federal policy question than the four of us are equipped to handle. There has been, to my knowledge, the federal government has permitted one facility for export. Because of low cost, cleaner fuel, we are attracting manufacturing jobs back to the United States. I understand why you say it's going overseas. Because that gas is not going to go into the southeast. And that gas is not coming from all these different companies. That gas is EQT gas. They wouldn't be putting in these huge pipelines and have all those wells and what, give their gas to some other pipeline to ship somewhere for them? But that's, right, that's the way the business is done. I mean, people put them on the pipelines, it goes to different markets. When you're building an infrastructure, when you're trying to take over this whole Appalachian Basin to do an infrastructure for your gas transport, and that gas is coming out of the frack counties in northern West Virginia, and it's owned by the people who own the pipeline, come on. That's EQT gas, and there's too much of it. It's not going in this country. There's no public need. I disagree. Many of these companies have sold their shale leases because of the big companies particularly because they know that they, they can't make any money on them. The gas industry is in trouble at the moment because of falling prices, both the oil and the gas industry. They've, uh, they've, they've been through this massive boom. They've drilled thousands of wells across America, across West Virginia, Pennsylvania and elsewhere, and they've crashed the price of, of both oil and gas. That is straining their finances. They're now idling uh, rigs, they're drilling less, but they're still planning these pipelines. Of course I'm angry because I feel that the private citizens no longer have any rights in this country. The country is now controlled by big business because big business feeds political figures. So everything is against us. Corporation's not a person. Corporation's not a person. No, we need to get the dirty energy money out of politics, whether it's in the presidential race, whether it's in the congressional races, whether it's in the local races, at the state and capital level. Our politics is completely polluted by that money. We will be here for the next 40 or 50 years. I said, how are you making any money? Our midstream operations are what's making us money and keeping us afloat. And my comment was, it seems like a giant Ponzi scheme to me. You bring investors in, you know, to do X amount of wells, then you bring more investors in so you can pay off the first set of investors. Absolutely, he said, that's the way it works. Yeah, people support the pipelines because they think of other issues, international issues, trade issues, whatnot. But they don't really realize that we're killing our country. Everything that we have is going to be destroyed if this kind of thing continues. We live in a small town that is in the middle of coal country and gas country. We're being raped. They want to fill these holes with fly ash. Okay, these are eight by eight trenches. They want to fill them with fly ash from coal, which is going to put carcinogens into the groundwater. 
They want to send the gas to France. They are not allowed to frack in France or those countries over there. But they want to frack America and ruin our life. It's more precious than gas or oil. It's our bloodline. It's our life. It's our water. Mount Valley Pipeline in their water resource report to the FERC identified one spring within one mile of the pipeline. Gap Mills PSD, the Union Water District, and the Red Sulphur PSD all use springs off of Peters Mountain for their water source. And the underground water system does not listen to above ground property lines. You may have a spring on your property, it may be coming three or four miles away. If the aquifer gets polluted, it's going to stay polluted. Um, and then you're going to have to move or buy water, or they may offer you a water buffalo to sit next to your house, which is this large, ugly container with some crappy water that they give you. As uh, Walt Timbrick here in the Market Bulletin said, West Virginia has perhaps the best water resources of any state in our entire nation, and that's the truth. And the reason for that is, is because of the limestone filters that we have in our state, the rock filters. People in Monroe County woke up to the smell of gasoline in their tap water. The Red Sulphur Public Service District, which is the water company, immediately shut down uh, the plant. Their initial tests were positive for both gasoline and kerosene in the water supply. They had to drain water tanks, uh, completely clean them, replace components of the filtration system. The source of the contaminant was found to be the corridor of a gas pipeline that crosses through the protected watershed of the Red Sulphur Public Service District. The pipeline in question is only an 8-inch pipeline. The Mountain Valley Pipeline is a 42-inch pipeline. It also wants to cross through the protected watershed of the Red Sulphur Public Service District. Their alternative route crosses through the protected watershed of the Peters Mountain Aquifer area. Hydrogeologists believe this is a very large aquifer, maybe extending as much as 75 miles. A contamination in an aquifer such as that may be irreparable. So there are two routes that EQT Corporation has proposed through Monroe County, neither of which is safe to the public. We need to protect our environment. This area of Virginia is beautiful. It's known as one of the most scenic, most beautiful areas in anywhere in the country. We have a spring on our land that we can document has been flowing freely for over 150 years. And this spring feeds our geothermal heat pump. However, if they start blasting this ridge that my spring comes out of, they're going to disturb all the fracture lines that currently feed the spring. That is, of course, on top of perhaps contaminating our water. Many of us get our drinking water from springs or shallow wells. Uh, here in Sinking Creek, we have some uh, new species of crayfish that have never been described. And the next stream over, Johns Creek, we have the James spiny mussel. It's a federally endangered species, and it's incredibly sensitive to sedimentation and turbidity in the water. But they can move the pipeline route to avoid the Johns Creek and Cray Creek watersheds due to their importance to the conservation and recovery of this species. <coughs> you know, that sounds like such a good idea that the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service recently told MVP's environmental contractor exactly that move this pipeline. These species exist in the headwater streams of the James, Roanoke, and New River systems that originate in Montgomery County. These species are sensitive to runoff caused from construction projects like the proposed pipeline, leading to sedimentation in the waterways and destruction of habitat for those species. How frequently are you fighting landowners over when they, they're coming to you and saying our wells are, are, are gone? In all of the drilling that we have done in the Marcellus area, we've not contaminated any water wells. How can you be sure? We have studies. We do pre and post testing of those wells, same as we would do um, for the pipeline. And there's not been any instances or any reports of us contaminating any water wells during our drilling activity. One of the things that they say is that in the years that they've been doing it, uh, they have not polluted any water. Now, the reason they say that is, 
all of the water has already been polluted by <laughs> the coal mines. When you're coming straight up and down a, a mountainside, the potential for erosion and sediment running off is just tremendous. So, you know, literally uh, one big event could just wipe out the trout population from that crossing down. MVP told FERC, we're going to cut across every stream. That's the best way to do it. We're going to divert the stream, we're going to dig a trench, put the pipe in, cover it up, put the stream back. That uh, that's on every single stream, um, including the Gauley River and, and other things that size. <laughs> Residents said, we'd like to see some proof that this is really the best way to do it. Well, MVP did some mumbo jumbo, pulled some numbers out of a hat. The numbers that MVP gave to FERC underestimate stream flow by anywhere from four to 20 times. Here in Sinking Creek, the geology is karst. There's a lot of caves, there's a lot of connections between the ground and the water supplies. And the pipeline's gonna be a 10 foot deep trench right through some of that karst habitat. Uh, when those engineers and uh, and geologists as well, working for those companies and the consulting companies. They're, they're saying, well, we work in karst all the time. We put pipelines in through karst. But one has to realize a pipeline of this size, 42 inches in diameter, has not been put across the Appalachian fold belt. It hasn't been done. We're talking about a lot of environmental mitigation that would have to be done, and I'm not so sure they really know enough to be able to mitigate? It's an unknown. Yeah, they, they routed to try and get around all the sinkholes by putting it up slope on the severe steep slopes where it's going to affect the water transport into these areas. You can't just say, well, we'll go around it. Because if you try to go around it, you're still in it. He said they are headed for disaster at, guess where, the Sinking Creek covered bridge, the Link Farm covered bridge. He has three things he says, it's got carbonate rocks, you've all seen it, that's big boulders the size of Volkswagens that they're gonna to have to displace above it. He said then it's got karst terrain below it, but it also has something unique, it has Sinking Creek. And what is it about Sinking Creek that is unique? It sinks. And when it sinks, it's going to go to groundwater. And when it goes to groundwater, there are going to be fissures. And when there are fissures, there is going to be erosion and conduction. And it's going to potentially put that pipeline at risk of existence. No matter where they are, to one degree or other, they're going to run into karst problems. The casting report, which has been submitted to the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, is an incredible document. It is based on the best science. It is um, based in the, on the current literature from referee journals. It has been reviewed by two leading experts on Karsten geology in this particular region who agree with Dr. Casting's findings. That with beyond a doubt, this report will probably be our biggest blow so far to the Mountain Valley Pipeline, convincing the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission that this region is a no-build zone, period. So the geology cuts both ways and includes the seismic hazard, uh, that could rupture the pipeline in this known active seismic zone just to the west of here in Giles County. It could happen through slope stability issues. There are steep hillsides that the pipeline has to go across that are subject to downward movement just simply through gravity, but potentially uh, exaggerated and accelerated through, uh, through earthquake or seismic activity. You mentioned seismology and, and the risk of that. Right. No, I did not. And, and that's because it is not a major risk to pipeline construction. There's <laughs> <laughs> There's no yeah. Be, beyond consideration of the geologic conditions, there are not federal regulations for seismic, seismic conditions. Oklahoma is now the earthquake capital of the world because of the fracking industry because they frack our land and, and they uh, put disposal wells in where they dispose their chemicals and salt water and that directly contributes to the earthquakes. I worked in Doddridge for a year and a half, which is frack central or frackistan, and People's lives were jeopardized because emergency response could not get through to them. You need to think about this. Now, the Atlantic Coast Pipeline is what we're facing. 
and it's going to go under uh, our major roadways that people travel to get north and south in the county. It's going to go under our river, which is our water source for the town, and it's less than half a mile from the high school. I went to my fire department about this, and I asked if anybody realized the proximity of this pipeline to the high school, and people were oblivious to it. You have kids getting on the buses and getting off the buses along the roads, and with the traffic of a construction site, evacuation of schools could be a, a big, big issue. Apparently all the children on the school bus up here are talking about this all the time. They're frightened of that. There's just an awful lot of damage that's done that can't even be quantified when you do something like this. You can't fight a gas fire, water will spread it. So you have to just, you got to get it turned off. The vapors burn, so you, you can't fight that. All you can do is, is protect the uh, perimeter around it. You have to have people with the knowledge of where all the valves are, and it could be a mile or more away from where you have uh, your uh, actual explosion. People forget that uh, the pounds per square inch going through these pipelines is tremendous. And uh, the size of the pipeline itself is, is tremendous. So the potential for a catastrophe are there just because of that. Since 1986, there have been over 8,000 pipeline incidents, resulting in more than 500 fatalities. 2,400 injuries, and over 7 billion in property damages. I used an EPA model to model an explosion in the Preston Forest neighborhood of Montgomery County. This model shows that the leakage of methane gas could extend over thousands of feet, including a blast radius of over 1,100 feet that could potentially level houses throughout the neighborhood. It takes very little for that pipeline to explode like a balloon. A hole that is four times the thickness of the pipe is all it takes for it to catastrophically fail. Which can happen easily accidentally or through corrosion or a terrorist act. A 550 mile pipeline that has the potential of an atomic bomb is a terrorist target. And it's easy to find. It's totally unprotected. It's a disaster waiting to happen and it's totally unnecessary. It's like living with a bomb, a pipe bomb buried in your backyard. And uh, I'm not being a crazy alarmist. I've just done the research. I've looked into it and these things do blow. Just a wall of fire, flames shooting at least 75 feet in the air. Take a look at that. Police and firefighters couldn't get close as homes were destroyed. I had this vision of the pipeline exploding on the road leading to my hollow and it acting as a blowtorch where all this gas and flame engulfs the entire hollow. It burns down the barn, my house, in a, in a matter of seconds and then sets the entire woods on fire. And the beauty of my property would be threatened by the line even if it doesn't explode. Huge fireball burns homes and a fleeing man. This guy in, in his house heard the explosion, ran outside, and the fireball was coming, and he took off running down the road, scorched him. He wound up laying in the middle of the road. Somebody came and picked him up and carried him off. This pipeline company has its own workforce of 4,000 people that they've already hired. They're going to have them follow this pipeline from county to county until it's done. Nobody from Monroe County is going to get hired. There might be one permanent job, maybe two. Local jobs. Oh, no, no, no. I've had long discussions with Dominion. These are going to be local jobs. I've been very insistent on that. We're talking about $6.7 billion that will only create 75 permanent jobs. I believe we could go to the Yellow Pages in any county in Virginia, if we still had Yellow Pages, and if I offered them $6.7 billion, I guarantee any small business would be able to create more than 75 permanent jobs. Um, it, it's true in any type of major construction process, um, particularly in pipelines. Um, 
there is a need for a specialized, highly technical skill set that could come from out of state, from out of state. For many years, the utilities have wanted to control everything, which means they want to control where the energy is produced and from what sources and pipe it in through their own pipelines in order to be able to sell it to you in a one-way transaction. That's not how the world works anymore. The fact of the matter is, if you have a farm, you could throw up a few solar panels or some turbines and be able to not only power your own house, but sell some of that back to the grid. And it should be a two-way process here in the 21st century. We live in a heavily forested, bucolic setting uh, in southwestern Virginia. We're looking at over 4,000 acres of land cleared, including some of the forests that we prize uh, living in kind of central Appalachia. Monroe is a rural county, it's an agricultural county. We don't have a single four-lane road in the entire county. So, you know, as they travel through the county, they're either going to be traveling on two-lane roads or sometimes narrow single-lane paved or dirt roads. And, you know, it's certainly going to be an issue. I'm sure there's going to be traffic congestion. I'm sure there's going to be damage to the roads. When a company owns an easement on a landowner's property, they can do what they want with that strip of land forever. They own that land forever. And so in the contract it may say one pipeline, but in reality they can add another pipeline, then another pipeline, then another pipeline. In Wisconsin it's happening to landowners right now. In an 80-foot easement there's already four pipelines when there should have only been one. And they're about to take another strip of land right next to that and add more pipelines. Even if a pipeline gets rejected, the pipeline company still owns that easement forever. And they can do whatever they want with it. They can sell it to another pipeline company, and the landowner literally has no say over that. Didn't your mom tell you you don't get something for nothing? Didn't your mom tell you quick cash is probably an illusion? I hope you're going to listen to your mom. You are really losing the use of that land, and you're still paying the taxes on it. One of the ways this would seriously affect my business is that I'm heading towards uh, becoming a legal dairy and I take the milk to my customers. If they ruin my road, I will probably be not be able to deliver any milk for a couple of years. And uh, they, I'm pretty sure they're gonna wreck our water. So it's pretty hard to farm without water. Just the beautiful, peaceful serenity, and which, which the goats like. It really comes down to landowners uh, and their love of their land and, and having that conservation ethic as part of their being. This is one, this is uh, many properties in this valley that are in conservation easement. I can only imagine that for some of them, uh, it really feels like a violation. My father was raised there. It's been in the family since uh, 1920 or so. You know, the valley's a part of me and just like I'm a part of it that unfortunately a conservation easement, even held by the state of Virginia, uh, is not a guarantee of protection against any sort of large infrastructure project that has some sort of federal standing. We can't afford to continue to lose land to poorly planned development, a poorly placed and planned in, you know, big infrastructure project. Uh, we just can't afford to do that. It's not sustainable. If, if the national energy policy is that we should be using more natural gas and fracking is the way to get it. I think 20 years from now that people are going to look back and say that was a big mistake. That was a, that was a dead end and we need to go to renewables. FERC has actually asked uh, the two pipelines, the Mountain Valley Pipeline and the Atlantic Coast Pipelines, to consider co-location because both pipelines are starting within about 20 miles of each other over in Wetzel County and are actually crossing each other. Uh, both have said that uh, they have no interest in it, it's not possible. If we are going to expand natural gas, if, if that is our societal and our economic mandate, there are really three ways we can do it. We can truck it, we can transfer it by rail, or we can put it into an interstate pipeline. Interstate pipelines are by far the safest way to transport natural gas. When they come in, they're going to first grade about 150 feet wide. Before they do that, though, if you have trees on the property, they're going to cut all the trees. They're going to push up all the stumps so they can grade it and have a clear open area. Then they're going to come in with trenching machines. And since we have karst topology and a lot of limestone, a lot of rock, 
they'll have to come in and first drill holes where the pipeline will go, put in charges, and break up the rock. They will have to use that. Once they have that done, then they'll have backhoes come in and dig the trench, and up to 11 feet deep. Once the, the trench is dug, they're gonna put stripping. It's called stripping, where they bring all the 42-inch pipe in 40-foot sections will be brought in. It'll be stationed along the pipeline. They have to lift that pipe up, and to do that, they have to have something called pipe layers. They're 60 ton, each one, a piece of equipment, and it may take five to seven of them, depending on what length of section they're trying to do at a time, to lift the pipes. Once they're off the ground, they'll be welded. Once they have a long enough piece welded together, then the pipe layers will lay it in the ground. When it's all the pipe is connected, which may take up to a year for it to be done, all of it, that's when they pressure test it by running water through it. They check for the wells, and at that point, they repair all the, the welded areas. Then they backfill with grading equipment, backhoes, and anything else that might be there. The equipment will be large, 60 ton, down to dump trucks, tractors, will all be back there. It's not gonna be very pleasant. How much property is needed to locate one of these compressor stations? Typically the footprint of a, uh, of, a, of a compressor station is about five acres. The compressor stations lose or use 7% of all the gas coming down the line. When EQT was asked about how they were going to, what the generators were going to do, they're going to be natural gas burning. It's going to take three or four 1,300 horsepower compressors, each one burning natural gas. And reportedly, by the industry, 7% of all gas flowing down the pipe is used for the compressors to pump the gas. When it's compressed, the fumes come out from it, and they also have loss of methane gas. Periodically, they have to blow the pipes open, and that methane gas is escaping into the air. It's a harmful thing to our environment and to anybody living within wherever the wind might take it. So from cradle to grave, natural gas production is bad for the environment, for the local environment, for water, for human beings who live there, and globally it's really changing the climate of the world in a way that's going to make it difficult for us to survive as a civilization if we don't stop this gas rush from taking place now. I know there's a lot of landowners in this room that probably have received notice. We want to know from you where the sensitive areas on that property are. We recognize that nobody knows better than the other. We will continue to work with those people, try to get voluntary access. Ultimately, if we cannot do that, we will send a letter informing people that in 10 days or after 10 days, we will access the property as for long. Um, first, the landowner is compensated for the easement that is obtained on the land, and that compensation is intended to provide for a diminution in value. The truth is, there will be no material diminution in value. That is what the studies have indicated. Actually, the tax revenue would increase as a result of the installation of the facility, so it will be in there. Well, that won't happen. We're already seeing them going down just talking about it. My house is one of the properties on the path for the pipeline at the moment. I've been trying to research what happens to property values when pipelines go through, and I can't find anything that's, that's equivalent to this particular neighborhood. It's hard to measure because what you can't measure are the sales that don't happen, the showings that don't happen, the clients who think about it and then choose somewhere else. You can't measure the non-activity. Nobody wants to buy this. and. Um... So it's the opposite of financial benefits. There's, there's no properties moving in Preston Forest or anybody's property in this whole area that's near a power line field. What I understand about the procedure by which the company compensates people, they say they're just, quote, taking an easement. They don't buy even the land they put the pipeline on. Uh, yes. I had a guy come to my property wanting to have the 
right survey, and I told him to leave. But he told me the easements and what they was buying, and he said there's already an easement on your property because the Appalachian power line runs through there. And we're going to use that same area. And there was no offer of compensation. He just said, please sign here and I'll be on my way. It's going to be very minimal compensation compared to what the damage is going to be done to property values, which I think will also then be a damage to the county's tax uh, revenues from real estate. These pipeline companies are going to make a lot of money, and that those profits are more important to the companies than uh, somebody else's private property. It's a question for each of you whether you want to let uh, a company on to survey your property. Uh, I think that it's pretty clear that the statute, the Virginia statute, allows it, but the U.S. Constitution may not. I live in Giles County. I've lived here for 45 years. And I got a punch in the gut when I found out that Mountain Valley's planning on putting the pipeline 200 feet from my house. We're within the blast zone. I mean, we would be incinerated if the pipe blew up. It's going to cross my driveway, so I'm concerned about access to my property. I have a well. The well is 500 feet deep, much deeper than where the pipeline will be. So I'm concerned about the well water. So I have to get my own water line either under or over the pipeline, which is be very difficult, it seems to me. Or I have to install my water line first before they even build the pipeline at my expense. We're not pleased with the dealings we've had with the pipeline folks, with the surveyors. They've attempted to come on our property without permission several times. We've run them off. They come in groups of anywhere from five to a dozen or more. He sat right here in this very spot all day long, never saw him. They come in on the backside, did the survey, left, and he just sits here all day long. 86-year-old man. I called them the next day and I said, hey, I thought y'all were going to do the survey yesterday. They said, oh, we did do it. I said, you did it? My dad sat there all day, never saw you. And just that alone just really stressed my dad that they lied to him like that. He had a stroke 11 days ago. They get to all the benefit. I get no benefit out of it whatsoever. It's all corporate greed. Geology surveyors had this map showing us one day how they were going to be, the route they were going to be looking at on the pipeline, and we noticed this yellow line. We say, hey, what's this yellow line about? And they said, well, that's the service roads that they're going to be using. And um, it so happens that that's the road that comes into the property that my dad's paid up in here to build, and they're just going to take it over. They're going to use that boat for construction work and maintenance after the pipeline's put in. I think that's disgraceful. George Jones grew up here and he delighted. You could just see the sparkle in his eyes every generation that he told the stories about this home place. Now he's sitting in the hospital with a stroke and he's blaming all this stress directly on that. Will not we do? This sacred ground is home to all my family, all my tribe. Will not we do? There's nothing you can give us that could take place Clean water And the company may change the route, but they, they publish one thing then they may change it, but along the way, they've also done a lot of damage to people's lives. By their carelessness, the map they used for the FERC filing doesn't even show this neighborhood. It's a topo map from 1983. This neighborhood wasn't there. This part of the neighborhood wasn't there. So I don't know that they knew it was here. They sat in an office somewhere in Pittsburgh, drew a crayon line on a map, and here we are. And these are the, the properties and the human lives that are in their crayon line. How are they going to put equipment to put the pipeline in on a place like this? Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, that's a thousand foot drop. I don't want to live like this. 
I don't want to have to worry about this. I've seen what just working on this has done to the people who have been involved. Then what do they do? Hang it in midair uh, through here? Uh, so you see the red dots on the trees. This is the edge of the National Forest. So they would be building in the National Forest here. But it's a roller coaster up and down between these ravines, and it's very severe. People have godlike power that they're wielding irresponsibly, that apparently our government has sold out to them against our constitutional rights. I think fracking is immoral. That's my opinion. But stealing people's land, it goes against everything that, you know, our country stands for. That's my house they want to take. And again, that's a kind of pervasive terror that I think lots of people here are feeling. We don't know. The world is changing really rapidly, and we don't know what's going to happen. One thing we do seem to know is no one will protect us. We are taking a non-renewable natural resource, non-renewable natural resource of just totally invaluable, and allowing a few private investors to sell it to line their own pockets. And to do that, we're risking our water, we're risking our land because of the erosion potentials, we're risking the health and safety of the people who live along the pipeline path. All of this so a few guys can make a buck. Is this the American dream? Is this what I grew up paying taxes to to support? Is this the future of our country? The, that the average American doesn't count at all? That it only matters if you have pull on Wall Street and pull in Congress and pull at the state level? What's going on? Who's minding the store? Distress means we're not in control. That's physiologically and psychologically debilitating. And this pipeline mess is causing distress. All of this is in jeopardy if a pipeline goes through this area. It's a big deal. Save our water. Our land. Save our water. Pipeline out. Save our water. Keep our land. I'm so glad you all are here today because most likely this may be the place where this pipeline stops. That's right. Yeah. 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 Um, what Dominion is proposing to do to cross the Blue Ridge Parkway and the Appalachian Trail has never been done before. Um, these mountains have stood here for millions of years because of the spine of greenstone volcanic greenstone that runs throughout this mountain range. It's never been penetrated by a 42-inch drill. Dominion's proposing to drill a mile underneath it, a mile across, 800 feet down. This is the blaze that shows we are on the Appalachian Trail. Um, we're probably within uh, 50 feet of the center line, um, of the proposed center line for the pipeline here. If the drill is unsuccessful or the engineers deem it unfeasible, then uh, Dominion's plan is to clear a 125-foot swath right across here. All these trees would be gone and blast through this greenstone all the way fr from south of the AT all the way across the top and across the Blue Ridge Parkway. That's what we're up against. And that's what... Uh, Dominion thinks is a good idea. Beginning of April, there was a uh, MVP open house meeting up in Union. And I started asking them how they would manage maintenance of that corridor on organic land. And first he said it was just gonna be done by virtue of mechanical mowing. And I kind of laughed about, you know, how you're gonna mow these slopes of Peters Mountain, for example. And he said, well, they do do some spraying for invasive species. I said, okay, well, you can't do that on organic land. So, so what's the plan then? There are also lawsuits, successful cases, where aerial spraying cannot be done within the drift area of an organic farm. And he said that pipeline companies will usually try to route their lines around organically managed land due to the extra burden imposed 
by having to develop an organic farm management plan and implementing that plan so as to protect the organic integrity of that land. And the little light bulb lit up and I said, I'm going to put these two together. We're going to self-proclaim the Monroe County Organic District and we're just going to come up with as many people that are willing to say that they're managing their land organically as possible. There is no acreage requirement to be organic or in any way, shape or form. This could apply to the largest certified organic farm on the planet or to your two tomato plants if you indeed want to protect your land is organically managed. By the time of the submission to FERC and MVP, we had 47 affidavits representing over 3,500 acres of land in this county. As a result of, of the affidavits and comments I submitted to FERC and MVP, as well as comments from a Craig County resident, Bill Wolf, who is a, a major organic e industry player, both his comments and mine actually resulted in MVP. I contacted the USDA National Organic Program to inquire about the nature of the program and its impact on their construction. The organic district concept is an excellent idea for, for the community, for the local farmers, and it is truly an obstacle to these pipeline companies because they have to address their herbicide use and how they're going to comply with the National Organic Program. Okay, here we're standing at the Gore property, which lies right between my two apiaries, uh, within 100 feet of each side where we have over 135 uh, Italian honeybees that we breed and they are survivors. They've survived over the last eight years where the rest of the country literally we lose 50 percent of all of our bees. Remember no bees, no food. But we're standing in natural habitat of clover, abundance of poplar trees, locusts, all on the pipeline that they want to destroy and basically eliminating some of the most pristine bee habitat in the country. It's not just a, a, a hypothesis, it's a fact. These bees survive here because it's natural. The bees are dying everywhere else in the country because of the pesticides. We don't have that here, but yet they want to come in and spray all our area, destroy all this, and then continue to spray it to keep the plant vegetation down, therefore killing our bees in probably the most pristine, perfect bee habitat in the country. Mountain Valley Pipeline sent surveyors to study for a pipeline route in Monroe County. There was a couple who, who fought the, their right to be on their property and took it to court. At the county level, Brian and Doris McCurdy are having their day in court seeking to bar Mountain Valley Pipeline access to survey. Judge Irons is about to rule on this critical injunction that eminent domain may not be invoked where the public use has not been established. Pipeline companies organized for transporting gas must serve the people with gas along the entire line traverse. They are not vested with eminent domain and therefore they cannot avail themselves of the West Virginia statute that purports to give survey access. MVP is trying to make as many end runs around the state regulations as possible, hoping that, you know, they get to the point where the federal regulation will trump the state eminent domain law, but right now they're just are trying to run roughshod over people who are trying to approach this case with the powers of the state law because we are not at a case of eminent domain law yet. Is this pipeline regulated by the Public Service, the West Virginia Public Service Commission? It is not. And repeatedly, the MVP lawyer has dismissed the notion of public use as if it doesn't matter, but the state law is very explicit on that, and the judge gets that. Thank you. If you have fewer than 25 customers, you're not considered a public utility. Okay. What tax uh, for LBCs have you committed to in West Virginia? Specifically, at this point, uh, I'm aware of none. 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 Basically, they have not met the requirements of the West Virginia law to establish that they have a public use of this pipeline. Um, along the entire line traverse. Declaratory judgment that there's no that A, the Mountain Valley Pipeline is required to show public use before they can have the right to enter on the lands for uh, purposes of conducting surveys under 5413. This ruling sets a precedent and validates West Virginia law, disallowing access where the public use is not established. It was a big day for us. Individual rights are no longer to be trumped on. Rather than appeal this court case, the natural gas industry asked the state legislature to bail them out 
by instigating Senate Bill 596, a bill that would change West Virginia state law to broadly allow gas company surveyors on private land without permission. The bill was defeated by a bipartisan majority of the state Senate in February of 2016, and Judge Iron's ruling stands. A ruling this week by the West Virginia Supreme Court of Appeals uh, affirmed an opinion of August 2015 by a Monroe County Circuit Court judge who found that Mountain Valley Pipeline had failed to demonstrate that their transmission pipeline served a public use in West Virginia. The state of West Virginia can only delegate eminent domain or exercise eminent domain for the benefit of West Virginians. It cannot do so for the benefit of, of citizens of other states. The public use has to be for West Virginians. Virginia law allows pipeline companies to survey private property without permission for a pipeline route. It's different from the West Virginia law in that it does not require a showing of public use. However, people opposed to the Virginia law believe it allows taking private property by a private company without compensation. The Virginia Supreme Court is going to consider whether the law is unconstitutional sometime in early 2017. People from all walks of life are taking direct action, staging events to educate, and rallying support to stop the fracking and stop the pipelines. How would you like to make art that protects your property? You can do that by copywriting work that you've actually placed on your property that is a part of your property. There's an artist in Canada who actually, uh, over the course of multiple years, created sculptures on his property. When they went to put an oil pipeline through it, he actually stopped it. Aviva Romani, an artist in New York, an environmental artist and activist, has started this project with people who are fighting the Algonquin incremental pipeline. I am an ecological artist, and what that means is I look at degraded systems, analyze them, and design solutions based on aesthetic principles. This is a potential uh, path, uh, alternate path 93 of the Mountain Valley Pipeline, and uh, this is a form of protest that we're doing and uh, create a work of art. If the pipeline is not for the public good, and they're taking trees, yeah. that have artwork on them that are copyright protected, can we actually stop the pipeline? We've considered each corridor in which natural gas pipelines are proposed or proposed for expansion and visualized them as musical lines. And in those musical lines we've designated trees like these and painted them with an ultramarine casein paint of ultramarine blue, which is non-toxic, and buttermilk, which grows moss. And each designated tree becomes what I call a tree note in the symphony. Each of these sine waves on the trees that have been designated in a musical score creates a relationship between the tree, the tree roots, the soil, the water, the aquifer, so this is not a site-specific work. This is a biogeographical sculpture. It connects to not only a specific habitat or a specific site, but to an entire constellation of biological and geographical factors that can't be moved. So the music is beautiful. There's a website you can go to to hear the music. I'm not here today because of what a dire state our drinking water is in. Just paying attention to the things that have been going on just within the past few weeks, the mine breach into the Animas River, the raging fires all up and down the west coast, you know, the, the resistance that's really being 
pushed to the edge, you know, this very creative and interesting project using copyright law to create this artistic piece to help save huge swaths of land a non-linear way about what the process of resistance can look like and preparing us for everything that is to come. What you're seeing behind me is the installation of the first group of objects from the Blue Tree Symphony. Whereas the outdoor work was an experience between the painters, performers, and the trees as understanding how being at one with the environment is synonymous with the cultural aspirations of any community. You know, the biggest thing that we learned on the pipeline was that you had to get people out from behind their computer desks and off of the farms and ranches to come together in community and to do things with their hands. So they weren't only writing letters to the president, super critical, or only writing emails to the State Department, but that we were building a sense of community. And you do that through actions, like the folks here in Virginia in painting the trees. For us in Nebraska, that was building a solar barn inside the pipeline route. And I think that those creative actions actually do stop pipelines. I think it has been a concern over the last 15 years to, to watch some of the um, landmark legislation, Clean Water Act, um, being set aside. Uh, it is, I think, short-sighted, and we've all got to work hard to look towards the future. The younger people especially recognize the importance of a clean environment, and they want to have a cleaner environment for the future. And they want to have uh, sustainable energy. They don't want fossil energy, which is eventually going to go away. Some of my classmates live close to the pipeline route, and studies have shown that people who live within a half mile of the pipeline have adverse health effects. Also, fracking, the way the natural gas is extracted, puts dangerous chemicals into drinking water. Over 25% of those chemicals are carcinogens, 50% harm the brain, nervous system, immune system, cardiovascular system, and your kidneys, and 37% interfere with your hormones. These chemicals seep into the groundwater as well, some of which runs into larger rivers or even the ocean. I hope that you will take my views into consideration. Sincerely, Neil Klumba. I do not want corporations like EQT and Next Air to speak to my values. Definitely against it. Absolutely no pipeline. We will not let you drill this pipeline! Show me what democracy looks like! This is what democracy looks like! Three. We will not let you build this pipeline! And if everybody in this room got involved and did a little bit of research and told one other person about this pipeline project, we could spread the word throughout Blacksburg and beyond. Oh. You know, when you can bring music and people together for a cause, I think it makes us remember who we are as humans and what we're supposed to be doing. And, and it feels good. And I think the more we do it and the more we gather and we raise our voices together, the more difference we can make. You know, we're dealing with the same thing up in Massachusetts. The pipeline's going through there or they're trying to put it through there. It's not going to happen. In April of 2016, after failing to sign up enough utility customers and facing stiff consumer and political opposition, energy giant Kinder Morgan pulled the plug on its $3.3 billion natural gas pipeline proposed through parts of Massachusetts and southern New Hampshire. What made your cop kill my sister and brother? You'll have to talk plain cause I sure have to know. Why do you burn my farm and my town down? I've got to know, oh, yeah. yes, I've got to know. The point has been made repeatedly. Only we, the people, by virtue of our numbers, have the power to effect change and say no more to dirty energy and yes to renewables. Stop construction at Coe Point. Stop construction Our at Coe Children and Stop. families are being harmed by the emissions that you're allowing to be put right into their neighborhood, where they have to live, where they do sports, and they're breathing them in, and it's causing them to have disease and early death. You're criminals.
if we expressed ourselves through the proper avenues, they'd simply continue to ignore us as they have been doing. This is the most dysfunctional Congress that I can remember. They can't get their act together to do anything. We are a democracy. The people ultimately will have their say, but they have to participate. They have to be educated, and they have to be informed, and they have to make their views known. Utility company Roanoke Gas has just acquired a 1% stake in the Mountain Valley Pipeline, facilitating the company's claim of public use, just as they prepare to file their formal application for a certificate of necessity to the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. Are we going to get to use it here in Virginia? Oh, yeah, a 1% share of uh, the Roanoke Gas Company. Did they give it to Roanoke Gas so that they could say they have a Virginia market to justify eminent domain? We've read all this because we didn't want to make uninformed statements to the public. If FERC approves this thing, we intend to show all of our data to a, a judge and make FERC eat crow. These are the clippings that I have collected from our local papers over the 18 months that are against the pipeline. This, these are for the pipeline. I think one of the um, tactics we've seen from those trying to push this pipeline and push it quickly is the argument of inevitability, the idea that it's already done, uh, that this is that there is no authority to stop it. But actually under the Clean Water Act, there's a section, Section 401, that allows for an independent state review to look at the environmental impacts, including on clean water under the ground. The state of New York has used this process already uh, to bring out deep questions about pipelines and about fracking. Uh, here in Virginia, that authority had not been used in the case of the pipelines, but is now being invoked, it appears, to allow for an independent Virginia review of the impacts on water under this section. We believe that that's been an important additional tool in the arsenal um, and what we've seen I think because of activists, uh, because of lawyers who've done their homework, and because of a few candidates who've forced the question into the press uh, that we are seeing that those reviews are being called for now. I think we do need leaders who get elected uh, not taking money from Dominion and the electric utilities, a pledge I've made and now we've had 60 House of Delegate members make the same pledge. Whose side are you on? That's what people need to hear. Are you on the side of the people and the side of the environment and the side of the future? Or are you on the side of short-term profits? That's really the big issue. Uh, my name is Russell Chisholm. We are outside the governor's offices here in Richmond, Virginia. And we're on day three of some peaceful action to basically get his attention about these dangerous pipeline projects. Why did you risk your own well-being to um, protests in front of the governor's mansion in his office building. Going back two years, I can remember at our earliest meetings, um, discussions that the possibility of taking this to this point, direct action, potentially getting arrested. One of the things that, that definitely uh, spurred me along um, to follow through with it was seeing the video of where he's where the governor is talking about dozens and dozens and dozens of meetings with these energy people and the pipeline builders and, and I'm thinking dozens of meetings <laughs> dozens of meetings and we can't get a meeting he has a press conference on the second day where he basically laughs that we're there saying there's a lot of demonstrations there this is just one more demonstration right so I mean he's arrogant uh, the, the Atlantic Coast pipeline as you know is a federal issue it is not a state issue Evening, Governor. Will you oppose the Atlantic Coast Pipeline and Mountain Valley Pipeline? Why are you going in the back door, Governor? Will you look your citizens in the eye? I do love my country, and um, uh, and I want it to work properly. Is that this whole process of deciding whether to build pipelines through our communities or our state is not a democratic process, and there's no place for the people in the affected communities to have any voice in this process. There's a pretense that we have a voice, but we've learned that it's all a charade. Right. It's all pro forma. Two, four, six, eight. Who do we appreciate? Russell! 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 So why take direct action against our governor? Because we're locked out of the democratic process. We're locked out at the federal level because it's an independent regulatory association. 
that does say we have all these opportunities for the public to speak about the impact on their communities and we did that. It's getting to that point and seeing that all the work we've done for two years of working through institutions was for naught and it doesn't even, re it isn't even reflected in their written decision making process. What is there left for us to do but to go outside of the regular institutional process and go to Richmond and speak to our governor and, uh, and then get a ticket trying to talk to him. Yes, I'll do it again. We really need to connect with the greater community, um, much the way that Standing Rock, Sioux, you know, ha have been able to raise awareness about the Dakota Access Pipeline that started with a handful of people. Uh, we need that kind of response down here, and I, I think it's going to happen in far southwest Virginia and with our neighbors over in West Virginia. Um, where we're going to have to come up with uh, almost like a border stand um, against Mountain Valley Pipeline. I'm talking about the people who live down here in these sacrifice zones. The major issue there is that the Dakota Access Pipeline is trying to cross the Missouri River. Um, they want to drill underneath the Missouri River and put a, a pipeline under the Missouri that's going to deliver crude oil from the Bakken oil field to a refinery in Chicago, Illinois. The state of North Dakota has called a state of emergency and asked for extra re additional resources from the United States government. Um, they brought in National Guard. There's been over 200 agencies involved. Um, as always, we are unarmed and always in, in prayer and in peace and just trying to protect the water, not only for our people, but for the 18 million American citizens that get their drinking water from the Missouri River. This is not a, a, a native issue. Um, they try to say that this is an Indian uprising or this is just a native issue, but this is a human rights issue. This is also a national security issue when there's millions of American citizens, that's water has uh, the potential to be contaminated that, that makes it a national security issue. Look at what you're doing! Look at you! Why are you hurting me? Why? Water is life! 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 The Obama administration has asked DAPL, the Dakota Access Pipeline, to voluntarily stop within 20 miles of the river, stop construction. Um, a federal judge did grant a temporary restraining order, um, which has now been revoked and uh, the injunction has been lifted. So they are continuing to, to construct up to the river. Um, we hope that we can have the fortitude to stay in this fight through a North Dakota winter. We're trying to winterize and uh, you know, it's one of my biggest fears that we may lose somebody to exposure, but the people aren't willing to, to stand down. The people are gonna stand strong on Standing Rock. This is the first time in history that 300 indigenous nations have come together to stand in solidarity for, for one cause. And so it's not only a, a awakening of indigenous people and awareness and a, and a time of, of renewal of our rights as indigenous people uh, to live on the land and protect the land and water and uh, our natural resources, but it's a global awakening. And that's what we're standing for at Standing Rock. You know, we are pipeline fighters, we're water keepers, we're people of the land who are standing up to big corporations, and, it, and that is their worst nightmare. The only thing that is going to stop these pipelines is the people standing shoulder to shoulder despite differences of politics and everything else that, may, that they may try to use to divide us. They call them the seeds of resistance because they symbolize the resistance to the destruction of Mother Earth. The corporate greed, the resistance to corporate greed, 
We want to save our land for our future generations, bottom line. We want our children and our grandchildren to be able to, to live in balance and harmony with Mother Earth. I've worked all my life to pay for my farm if they want to run a gas line through the middle of it, destroy ancient oak trees, sacred Indian burial grounds. Not one entity has stopped the pipeline or any pipeline without going to court or unless it was presidential decree. Now we're on the X on the X Keystone XL <laughs> pipeline <Yeah>. route. <laughs> it's been wonderful since the president rejected that. My wife and I, we now actually smile once in a while. You know, we can laugh and we can sleep at night. But there's part of us that said the job's not done. And part of that job is right here in West Virginia. You know, we deeply believe in all these pipeline fights across the country that there's three ways that we can beat them. The first is to end imminent domain for private gain. There is absolutely no reason in America that a private corporation can come in and tell an American citizen that they're going to take land against their will. So we got to stop that at the state level and the federal level. The second is a climate test. You know, President Obama, for the first time in our country's history, and so far it's been the only time, used a climate test on a piece of fossil fuel infrastructure, and that was on the Keystone XL pipeline. And it was one of the big reasons that Keystone XL was rejected, was because the State Department and all the other federal agencies assessed that pipeline and said, how will this impact climate change? If it's going to increase climate change, we're going to reject it. And so we've told the president that if a climate test is good for Nebraska, a climate test is good for Virginia, a climate test is good for West Virginia, a climate test is good for Pennsylvania. And the third way is local permits. You know, in New York, the Constitution pipeline was rejected because of a local permit around water. And we can use these local permits as a way to stop these pipelines. And all of these things, you know, stopping imminent domain, climate test, and local permits has to be done with an unlikely alliance. If it's just the environmentalists, if it's just the landowners, if it's just the young people, if it's just the faith leaders, they will divide and conquer. That's the best thing for oil, big oil and big gas. But if we all come together, the cowboys and Indians, the farmers, the ranchers, the landowners, the mountain people, if we continue to stand shoulder to shoulder, that's when we win. If we allow them to build these pipes, it'll be the place where the gas production growth is gonna come from in the United States. No other place has the potential to double production in the next five or ten years, that's what they want to do. They've already increased it a thousand percent since, since 2006. So we're going to be making that case about the 18 to 20 pipelines that are being proposed to expand that gas production. Mountain Valley is in fact the biggest of, of those, at two billion cubic feet a day. And we've taken that report and we've uh, promoted it to the environment movement more widely in the United States, you know, the big green groups, Sierra Club, etc. And they're saying, you know, enough is enough. We cannot build any more of these projects. The impact of gas is, is too great. We cannot solve the climate issue by building more fossil fuel infrastructure. So we also took the report to the White House. We took it, we took it to CEQ. Now, the administration has led in uh, implementing the Paris Agreement, bringing other parties to the table. And the Paris Agreement was ratified uh, just last week by India and the European Union. US and China have already ratified, and that means the agreement comes into force on November 4th. It's now this, this US federal government's policy to work towards keeping climate change well below two degrees as, and pursuing 1.5 degrees. That's in the Paris Agreement. The, the biggest thing that I've learned is that it, it doesn't take a, a huge action to make a difference. It takes a uh, community coming together, uh, neighbors standing arm in arm. Amen, horse. Amen. <laughs> Thanks for being here. Thanks for being here. We needed to hear what you just said. <laughs> they rely on us thinking everybody, we can't. Everybody done yep. and they just just prove the naysayers wrong. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> My people have a connection to the land. We, we've been the stewards to the land for time immemorial. But the people that are here now have buried their fathers, have buried their mothers in this land. They've buried their loved ones. Some have buried their children in this land. They have a connection to the land, the same as we have a connection to the land. When I look around here in the mountains, what a beautiful place it is. And the water, it's so 
pure and clean. Um, I don't have that where I live anymore. The, the place where I live is polluted. What you have here it is paradise on earth and, and it's worth protecting and it's worth fighting for. So I'm here to stand with, with this community and this county to tell them that they're not alone. It really helped my heart to feel like there is hope that we can fight this pipeline and fight someone who's so much bigger than us and seems so much more powerful, especially when they prayed over this corn and called down the power of the Great Spirit. It gave me strength. <laughs> All across our country, individuals that are Republican, Democrats, independents, populists, conservatives, we're all standing together. We need a federal end to eminent domain for private gain for fossil fuel projects, in particular pipelines, and we have to start protecting state property rights as well for the pipelines that are already in the ground, making sure that these pipeline companies are responsible for digging up that pipeline when it's at its end use and for making sure that when spills happen, liability doesn't shift onto landowners. These pipeline fights have been uh, real catalysts in our communities because, you know, th this is now not just happening, uh, you know, somewhere else. And that's how we're going to win by increasingly, you know, learning from each other and sticking together and standing up with our neighbors and fighting. I just got a text. A landowner just got arrested on her own land um, today when they were doing an action because they said that she was trespassing on her own land. What's happening is the pipeline companies are really saying that now people on the ground, citizens, Native Americans, elders, are armed militia is how they're describing them to the federal government in order to use stricter fines when they arrest them for doing non-violent civil disobedience. One of the most troubling things happening right now is that our journalists are getting arrested. And so Amy Goodwin with Democracy America and Josh Fox's film producer both recently got arrested when they were filming a citizen protest. They were reporting the news. And what is happening is that they're getting trumped up charges of felony trespassing and they're now being threatened with up to 45 years in jail, all for doing reporting and journalism. And for me, what this tells me is that the oil and gas industry know that they're on their last string. And one of the last things they have left is to jail our members of the media and to use fear and intimidation to citizens to make us stop acting. And the reality is, we're pipeline fighters. We're not stopping because we know we're on the right side of history. You know, I'm happy to be part of the pipeline fighter movement, and I'm confident that we're going to get this done. What do I leave my child? The thing that I love more than anything else in this world, what, what do I leave for her? What kind of world? And if, if we don't, you know, take an active role in trying to leave a, a healthy, sustainable world for the next generations, then I think that we have failed. Imagine if when it came to energy production, instead of a few multinational corporations controlling things, we allowed 30 or 35 percent of our energy to be locally produced through clean energy sources in our communities. I think the most important thing is to never let anyone else tell you what's possible and what's impossible. The fact of the matter is movements change our sense of what's possible. Politicians usually work within the sense of what's possible. Real change never takes place from the top on down or in the living rooms of wealthy campaign contributors. It always occurs from the bottom on up when tens of millions of people say loudly and clearly, enough is enough, and they become engaged in the fight for justice. Governor McAuliffe promised that he was going to tackle climate change, that he was going to be one of our nation's green governors, and yet you can't continue to build fossil fuel infrastructure and pretend that you're tackling climate change. And so we have a very clear message to Governor McAuliffe. Stop siding with the polluters and start siding with the people. He's not listening to the people who don't want the frack gas pipelines, the Atlantic Coast Pipeline, the Mountain Valley Pipeline. So we brought those voices to his house so he could finally hear these voices of his own citizens, his own vo voters who want solar panels, not pipelines. They want clean energy, climate justice, not corporate control over their land, the seizing of their property. They're fed up, they've had enough, and they brought their message straight to the governor today. Your voice matters. My voice matters. Our kids' voices matter. Don't ever let somebody 
tell you that March does not matter. Politicians hate when you put political pressure on them in the public. They hate when you go to their front door and surround mansions. They hate when you write letters. They hate when you show up to the state capitol demanding no eminent domain for private gain. And so let's today remember that we are putting pressure on Governor McCullough. And we won't take it anymore. Corporation's not a person. Corporation's not a person. Governor, start supporting Virginia and not Virginia. Let this become this for this. We are on a ship, a great big ship. It takes all of us to take care of it. And we can use the stars to navigate our trip. We are riding on a ship. Safety is first, so we'll need some supplies. Clean air and water, good food and sunshine. We can keep our men the galley with the beer and the wine. Without an immediate ban on these destructive, extractive industries, we are indeed heading for disaster. We are all connected, and in time, we will all be affected. We must and can rely solely on renewable energy resources. Change begins with you and with me and sharing that change with everyone. We are on a ship.